Good morning, happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. Coming off a stellar weekend. We just wrapped up uh, the Intensive 19 yesterday. Um, great group. Uh, we went hard. Uh, I think we went like two hours longer on Saturday than I think we've ever gone. So it was, it was great. Um, we were rolling in the gym there, so it was great. Um, speaking of the Intensive, uh, the intensive 20. We're probably going to lock in those dates this week. It looks like November 17th through the 20th, so you might want to check those dates on your calendar um, and then be ready because if we open up the applications, the, it fills up very, very quickly. And we only take so many applications at any one time because there's only eight people that are going to be in the room. So uh, please keep that in mind. But look at those dates today. Digging into today's Q&A, this is with Jack. And I've talked with Jack a few times in the past. Um, his initial question is about working with, with clients with anterior orientation, but this led us into some, some foundational concepts such as training in the available space. So we want to try to avoid pushing people into spaces that they don't have access to um, with their movements so we can avoid some compensatory strategies that actually might be interference or potentially lead to consequences um, that are undesired. Um, Moving people into a, a different orientation, for instance, if we take somebody from a flat foot contact to a heels elevated contact, will also alter that space. So again, we touch base on that. Giving your client an opportunity to learn. Uh, many times what we intend for the client is not what the client understands. And so they might not be great at something at first. So giving them an opportunity to change over time is also very important. Let them problem solve and, and figure some things out. So this is actually a great question um, for a lot of younger coaches or people that are, are just being exposed uh, to my model. So thank you, Jack, for your question. Everybody have an outstanding Monday, and I will see you tomorrow. I have a question about like anterior orientations uh -huh. and I was watching one of your videos on YouTube and um, I, one of your suggestions for them was putting them in positions that move them closer towards like the ER end mm -hmm. of like the propulsion spectrum. Like, uh, like early like they, ER? Yeah, or like, I mean, late on one side, early on one side, uh -huh. um, maybe like a, like a, a mountain climber or like a step up. Uh -huh. um, the only um, issue I could possibly see with that is if they don't have uh, like the hip flexion to get in the position on one side. Okay. So like, what would you, what would be an alternative, like position or what would in, you do in that in, scenario in standing or or does it matter um kind of either or because like i feel like if they don't have the hip flexion i mean like so like yeah like on your feet like i was thinking like a trx mountain climber or like a step up like both are on your feet so i mean yeah. or even in a even in the cross connect like some may struggle right like to get their one hip like Correct. So, so, yeah. so you, so you, so you would just have to drop. You would have to drop them out of that space. Um, okay. Honestly, something as simple, something as simple as a, uh, um, uh, a a heels elevated goblet squat. Okay. okay. You know, I'm talking about the whole yeah. foot elevated. So, so it's not just when we say heels elevated. The whole foot's on the platform. Uh huh. Like a right. ramp. Yeah, because what yeah. because what we're doing. Be the the orientation relative to the to the foot contact is that the center of gravity would be behind, right? And so then you're gonna you're gonna create the early representation um, by, by biasing the foot. You're gonna make it easier to capture early. So you're gonna be able to move the center of gravity back. So you're gonna slow them down. So they're usually getting pushed forward, right? So they're usually getting pushed it towards a, a later representation. You use the foot contact. To move the center of gravity back, um, where you can get the uh, early ER representation easier. Okay, and like the the um, medial heel, like foot contacts, as in medial heel and first mat head, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Because again, so we're talking about an early representation here, so you have to have both. Because if you, so if you, so let's just say you threw somebody up on the platform, and uh 
they can't capture like first met head. Yeah. Then obviously wrong exercise for right. sure. But they're, they're in a situation where there's no way that they're going to capture the internal rotation that you need to superimpose in an early representation. Uh -huh. So you're going to have to select another activity. So maybe you've got to move their, you got to move them into more of an ER space so they can actually capture that, that medial foot contact. Okay. And like, so for some people, you would probably have to like reduce the demands of gravity, right? To get Absolutely. them like ER space. Yeah. 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 Cause like, again, it's, it's, it, it, I mean, granted people move through space all the time that, that they're, they're not the world's greatest at doing it. They don't know it, but they're not. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you got to make it a little bit easier for them. So like <clears throat> you can drop somebody into a, uh, like some, some hook line, you could put them in a reclined. So if you did like a TRX squat where they're leaning away yeah. from the TRX, like that, that reduces the demand, right? And that puts uh, them in an early representation. So, so you can use that. Okay. Um, I was, so, um, like, would you, in the, like the heels elevated that you recommended, mm -hmm. um, like how deep would you have them going? Like, like comfort, like, however they feel comfortable like naturally or like because i couldn't well, make, if they don't okay the do you, uh, uh, you let me, drop them all the way down right if they don't have yeah. the hip flexion available well okay but hang on a second you change the rules when you as soon as you put them up on the on the platform you have changed the rules right like i put their foot i put their foot in a totally different representation than it would normally be on the ground systemically uh -huh systemically they're going to respond so the question is is like is that enough for me to make the change to use that activity yeah and you would have to so you do it and then you go i like it i don't like it yeah. right because you understand the principle of what you're trying to accomplish and you say well what's the what's the 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 most dynamic thing that I could do under the circumstance, controlling the situation from the ground up. So this is, again, you're going after an early representation. If I put the foot there, if I truly capture that early representation of the foot, you've immediately changed the systemic access to relative motions. Yeah. So you don't know how much hip motion they have now when you put them on the platform until you, till you execute. Right. And so you execute uh, and then you say, yeah. am I seeing a bunch of compensatory strategies that I still don't want? And then you go, OK, wrong exercise or uh, I coached it poorly or they didn't understand what I meant. Try it again. OK, still sucks. Move on. Do something else. Or it gets better as you coach them up, like give them an opportunity to try to make a change. Right. right. With a certain reasonable time frame. Uh, um, but again, it's like you're changing the conditions immediately. Yeah. Right. So their access to space changes immediately. Yeah. So the lack of hip flexion basically is uh, lack of ER space, right? So, yeah. So, so For the it's, most it's, part. it's the fact that they don't have they don't have the ER space in front of them where you would typically measure that, right? So their ER space is out here. So again, so an alternative is it's like, hey, just stick them out there in the ER space like where they are. You ever, and, and I know you've done this because you work with power lifters and you, you work with power lifters, right? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, why am I thinking that? Um, I, don't I, thinking? <laughs> I don't know. All right. So, uh, but, but have you ever taken, just widen somebody up, somebody's squat? Yeah, I have yeah. done that. Yeah. yeah. So you do, so, but you, you do that sort of instinctively because the squat doesn't look good. Right, and you go just move your feet out, toe out a little bit, and then it starts to look a whole lot better because you just moved them into a space that they have access to. So you could do that. So you don't like um, if you don't have a suspension trainer hanging around, or you don't have access to certain equipment. It's like, what do you got to work with? You got a box, awesome. So what if we have the same person and we want to, we want them to 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 squat? We'll just use the box, but I'm going to widen your stance out so I know that you can capture the medial foot cue. So at least I'm starting to superimpose the IR on top of it. Okay. So 
my only my only like um, worry there is like, aren't you? You're, you're so you're sticking them like how the question started about the anterior orientation, right? Uh-huh. Like, what if you're sticking them in like a middle representation too early, and they're still going to use that? into your orientation strategy like on a box so I, I know you were just like giving out a suggestion but like yeah you know, okay. another scenario if that's the case like, but, but, but how but how then how can i how can i manipulate them um a box squat yeah uh so what, i would think like stagger the feet or um i i do that i do that all the time uh, right? or have them have them fully like sit down on it and like yield into it okay so so don't confuse don't confuse the yield with the muscle activity okay that that right. that would be something you don't want to do no but it's like so so when you're playing with staggers what you're actually doing is you're playing with 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 their available space uh-huh. right you're, you're creating us you're creating slight turns that puts them out there in in a later representation on one side and an earlier representation on the other so so you're, yeah. you're progressively coaxing them if you will into those those available spaces there's nothing wrong with that because uh-huh. as they're descending in the squat, they are they are accessing more of an early representation. That's that's what has to happen when you descend into a squat, right? Without compensation, without compensation. So that so when people when people toe out, as they say, or they er their their hips to to do a squat, what they're trying to do is they're trying to access a space so they can access an early er. It's just like way out. From, from midline to start, because that's where they, they can capture the internal rotation. It's just not a very big space. That's all. Yeah, okay. So okay. like the reason they're anterior orienting most likely is because they can't access like that I, superimposed IR. There you go, like, there you go. So so by, by putting them in a space that they have access to, they are, they are, there is less demand for them to increase the orientation. But, but what you're doing is you're making a gradual change, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, won't, they won't have to anteriorly orient as much. Yeah. That, like, the, like the minute you capture, the minute you capture IR and ER, the musculature that is holding the pelvis in its anterior orientation, holding it there, no longer has to work as hard. So it yeah. reduces its output, and then, like I said, you're gradually going to gain internal rotation. It's just like any, any like any of the exercises that we use to capture relative motion is is following that same principle. We're putting them in a space that they have access to. We're superimposing the internal rotation on top of that. That's what captures the relative motion. Where you start, as long as you're in the available space, as long as you're capturing um, cues that will produce relative motion IR, you will be successful to whatever degree that they have the capacity to be. Yep. Okay. Good morning. Happy Tuesday. I have neuro coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. Hey, very busy Tuesday coming up. Um, first things first, we're going to go ahead and lock in the dates for the intensive 20 november 17th through the 20th so if you're interested in attending remember there's only eight people that get selected um so this is going to go out to the uh email list members first so go to any blog post on billhartmanpt.com and and put in your email address so you're on the list you will be the first notified so you'll have first opportunity to apply for the intensive 20 again november 17th through the 20th Digging into today's Q&A, this is with Matt, and uh, Matt has a client um, that has uh, some symptoms uh, that would be associated with upper DR, lower cervical compressive strategies. Um, this is a great question because it leads us to understand why the, the anatomy becomes important and why the compensatory sequence is useful because it allows us to see how these compressive strategies get layered on, and in turn, this allows us to determine the best course of action to alleviate uh, these compensatory strategies because there's a sequence in which they arise and then we just reverse engineer this. And so that's basically what this discussion was going towards. So if you have any questions about how the superficial strategies are layered on or how we would alleviate this, this is great for you. So thank you, Matt, for the question. 
Remember, uh, if you're not on the email list, please do so uh, sometime today because we're probably going to announce the, the intensive 20 applications being opened within the next day or so. Um, so get on that list. Everybody have an outstanding Tuesday, and I'll see you tomorrow. Mr. Hamilton. Hi, Bill. How are you going? It is going, is going well. Got the gun show out today, I see. I'll just buy tighter T-shirts every week. <laughs> Go got, a, got, got a got got a got a question about um uh, I got a fellow that's got a thing that he was told by his chiropractor is called T4 syndrome and uh, had a bit of a look on the internet in respect to it and it was a, a little bit vague. Uh, as far as the description of what that actually what that actually is, yeah. uh, and I was hoping you might have had some more interesting insight into if, whether you've ever heard of it, and if so, what it is. To me, it, it, it seems pretty similar to a lot of you know m m something similar to maybe like thoracic outlet or some of the radial nerve stuff, where you're getting a, a nerve compression, it's putting some referred pain down the down the arm. In his case. He's getting what pins and needles, but he's got quite a tight neck. But I've got some. He's he's got a history of uh, he's had like a C five C six compression uh, quite a few years ago, which has given him some ongoing neck rotation problems and associated muscle stiffness every now and then, depending on what activities he, he undertakes. Uh, but this is um, this recently he was moving some. I think it was batteries he was picking up maybe 50 or so batteries at work and he's reaching down from his like left hand side and stacking them up on his right hand side and that's triggered this current situation he's been getting chiropractic treatment the chiropractor came back with this t4 syndrome as a uh, diagnosis mm. i just i don't really know much about it you know much about it uh, there's a few things that are that are referred to in that area but let me give you let me give you a little hint to provide some guidance. Okay. okay. So if you draw a line straight through the axial skeleton, from, starting from the, the back of T4 and go straight through T4 and out the chest, do you know where that line goes out the chest? I don't, but I'm gonna guess that it's somewhere along the, the middle of the sternum or somewhere or further up. So, so, so think about this for a second. It, I'll give you another hint. Oh, yeah. The, the spinal level is usually about two levels lower than the anterior rib attachment. Right. Okay. So your T4 is at the second rib attachment to the sternum. Okay. Is there anything unique about that attachment? Like where it's attaching? Do you understand? Um, without, without my skeleton in front of me. <laughs> okay. You gotta say, Hang on. Uh, Hang yeah, on. Okay. Think, about, think about a compensatory sequence of compression. Well, I'm I'm thinking that you know perhaps down pump handle is going to okay. going to be some contributor there. Does the does the whole sternum go down at the same time? No. Is there a bend no. in the sternum? Say again. Is there a place to bend in the sternum? <clears throat> Um, manubrium. So between the manubrium and the sternum, there's a little synchondrosis, right? We call that the angle of Lewis. Okay. Yeah, one of these days, I'm gonna I'm gonna get an arcade or an, a a synchondrosis named after me. I think we'll try to figure that one out. Because whoever Lewis was, I don't know. Like, how does he get that? Anyway. <laughs> Point being is, when you think about the compensatory strategies that are associated with the compression, okay, 
um, there's, there's, and, and, I, and I don't know if you remember the slide, you, you've seen this slide, because I, I showed it when you're in the purple room, where you see the, the delineation of, of segments where the compressive strategies are layered on. So we have DR and we have upper DR, right? Yeah. We have sternum and then we have manubrium compression. And so there's a, there's a line that delineates the manubrium from the sternum that goes straight through the thorax and it kind of hits about T4 or so. What a coincidence. Mm. And then mm. um, from a structural reductionist perspective, they have to call things things, right? So they go, oh, you have T4 syndrome, which I don't know what that means. Um, you'll have a, a sequence of events that would be associated with that, that area that would potentially restrict motion. So you mentioned that the guy's got limited neck motion. He's had a compressive injury um, in the cervical spine. He's getting symptoms um, similar to what would be associated with the diagnosis of thoracic outlet. So what do you think he's getting compressed? Well, I can tell you he's a wide and he's, he's, uh, compressed both in dorsal rostral and pretty, you know, pretty smash, smash down upstairs. So, I, I, he's... well, my, my point is, is, is that, is that you're looking at somebody that probably has the upper, upper levels that are getting the compressive strategy superimposed. So you got somebody that's getting a compressed manubrium and a compressed upper DR because that would affect neck range of motion. That's going to affect the, the nerves ability to slide through tissue Right. So any number of symptoms that would be associated with that are probably associated with the fact that they've got the 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 uppermost aspect of the axial skeletal system compressed. Right. Yeah. There yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would lean in that direction. Not having seen this guy, I don't know. But but again, that's yeah. that seems to be what you're describing. Yeah, well, my... they just they, they need to call things in the, in the literature, and then then you know, like it's it's a human desire to have a reason behind something, so we can call something a T four, you know, that's fine. I don't care if if they call it that, um, but what what they're doing is they're they're just recognizing it's like oh, this aspect of the system does not move like it should, right? So if you can assist him in any way to get that area to expand and restore the relative motions, that would be. A, a pretty solid intention yeah yeah so yeah my, my thoughts were just dr expansion was the first thing that came to mind so um that sounds you'll, on you'll be on the right track right because yeah but but again think about think about the sequence of events here right what came last well okay. depending on how far how far, well, it's, it's if he's got DRs, if, DRs on there, it's going to be if he's got posterior be, lower, uh, if he's got posterior lower compressive strategy, you've got to alleviate that. Then you can go into the upper, upper DR and the manubrium. Okay. Mm. And maybe it doesn't take that long to, to alter his compensatory strategies to, to help with his symptoms, right? But again, yeah. you have that, but this is why you need to identify where he is in regards to strategy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're right. you're you're not thinking that like like your thinking is is pretty solid. But just just look at the sequence. Look at what has to happen for this guy first, and you'll you'll know based on um, whatever you know assessment process that you're using. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, that's that's all right. That's that that, that marries up with where I was thinking. So that's good. Okay. Thanks, okay. Bill. Good morning, happy Wednesday. I have neuro coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, well, today is Wednesday. That means tomorrow's Thursday, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Coffee and Coaches Conference call as usual. Grab a cup of coffee. Please join us for some great people, great Q&A. Um, start your day off with a little bit of education. Coffee Coaches Conference call, 6 a.m. Link will be on my professional Facebook page just prior to the call. A um, little bit of housekeeping item, intensive 20, uh, November 17th through 20th. Um, again, the, the uh, announcement will be going out to people on the mentorship list. Um, go to billhartmanpt.com, go to the bottom of the blog post, put your email in there, and you will be on the list to be first notified when applications open this week. 
All right, digging into today's Q&A, um, this is with Alex. And Alex's question pertained primarily to the mechanics and the, in the distal lower extremity, but it kind of points us to some mechanics that occur also in the pelvis at the same time. And then it also promotes the concept of how we change shape. So the reason we change shape is because you're 99% water, 1% stuff, and we have to behave as such. And so what we're doing is we're redirecting energy via shape change. So early, we're absorbing energy. Late, we're kind of distributing that energy um, with middle propulsion being the highest forces applied to the ground. So we kind of cover that ground a little bit. So this is actually a really cool question because um, it does cover a lot of foundational concepts. Always love that type of question. So thank you, Alex. Everyone have an outstanding Wednesday. See you tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., coffee and coaches conference call. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, what is the, like, the role of the proximal fibula at the knee? The role of the proximal fibula? Yeah, like R-O-L-E. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for clarifying. I, I don't know. What's it for? <clears throat> Does, well, it I mean, Does it move? Does it move? It moves. Okay, good. What makes it yeah. move? What make muscles? Uh huh. What makes it move? So muscles make it move. What else makes it move? Um, connective tissues, neighboring joints, gravity. Uh, the big G. Uh, reaction forces. Big what? G. The big G. Gravity. gravity. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So all of that stuff. All of that stuff is an influence. Okay. Why? Why isn't it? Why isn't it just fused? I mean, it does a few things. Yeah, but why isn't it fused? Why, 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 do, why do we even have two bones? What, what's the deal there? Not sure. I mean, it has some different role in absorbing and redirecting forces, I would assume. That's a brilliant answer. Right? In what direction, in what direction do those forces go? Actually, it's going to be energy. It's not really the force per se. It's going to be the energy that is translated, right? So, so, it, and it, and it, we can speak generically, right? It's the shape that determines what happens in in regards to a movement outcome, right? And so, so what we need is we need a way to to dampen, produce, direct the energies, right? And so, um, do you have Kapanji? I don't have Kapanji specifically. Okay, you should, you should, uh, there's probably other, other research. I, I just like, I like Kapanji. He's got pretty pictures and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> that gives you a pretty good description of things as to what is happening. And then the why would be, um, just another representation of the ability to create um, the shape that allows you to direct and manage energies, right? Mm -hmm. so, so if you're stepping forward and you're landing in an early foot representation, do you know the position and the, the dynamics of the fibula? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm with it. That was your right fibula, correct? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. See, I knew exactly what you were doing. Now, nobody else on the call did, but but you and I can have this private conversation, right? We'll just not worry about everybody else. Um, no, but you but you so you've got the right idea. Um, but but the reasoning behind that is is because it directs the energy where I need it to go to be most effective in regards to movement. Right. So real quick, real quick, um, as I push as hard as possible into the ground, what does that fibula do? And you can just, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it does that, right? Because it has to, it has to, to make sure that the, that my ability to produce force into the ground is going in the right direction. So the, the tibia is kind of moving in that direction anyway. Okay. But can I, can I redirect your attention? Of course. Go to the pelvis. Mm-hmm. If I, if I had a rudder on a boat, which bone in the pelvis would be my rudder? Sacrum. And if I had a, if I had a, a, a bone in the pelvis that was a paddle, what 
What bone would be the paddle? Ilium. Ilium. Who's some, somebody else? Somebody else said Ilium too. Who was that? Was that Don? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Good call, Don. I'm going to mute you though. Okay. <laughs> so, wouldn't it be cool if I had a paddle and a rudder <laughs> in the in the leg to help me direct that as well? It would be cool. Yeah. If only. If only. Hmm. Yeah. After that point, Alex, I'm kind of lost. I don't really have any direction there. So, so what do you think? So what do you think the fibula does now? Well, it, it redirects. It, I mean, it helps the wave move up and down the leg. Um, and it helps the knee rotate in a certain way. Yes. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm still, I guess so I still. A so there's a relationship there that the tibia is going to move in a, in a very specific direction, but it, but it also means that the fibula has to move in, in the opposing direction. Right. Okay. To make sure that the, that I get the right shape so that all the fluid stuff goes in the right direction. So the energy that's going through that fluid goes in the right direction. Okay. But they, they kind of, so I feel like they move in the same direction just relatively different like relative amounts so i have absolute motion right I, I have an orientation of the of the so everything below the knee can move in the same direction but with relative motions in a, in the opposite correct um here you go you ready late er on the right side of the pelvis looks like what Um, which way? So I'm on the right side of the pelvis. I'm in late ER. What, which sacral base is getting pushed forward? The right sacral base is getting pushed forward. Okay. If I'm in late ER in the right lower extremity, I'm about ready to push off with my foot. Um, how's the tibia going to prevent from getting like totally lost in regards to, um, too much ER? How do I manage um, ER? I mean, yeah. does the fibula block it? Well, it doesn't block it per se, right? That would be like saying that the ilium blocks the sacrum. Yeah. It exerts an influence on it. I, I like that. I like that term. I'll take that. It manages, it manages the position, right? It's so it helps control yeah. the amount of rotation. Because think about this. If you get too much tibia, like you should have tibial femoral ER in a late ER representation. But what if I get too much? Now what happens? Your what knee, happens? Your knee hyperextends. No, you get a bunion. Oh, uh, wait. You, oh. What'd you say? You get a bunion. The, right before that. What was the question? Uh, I don't remember. I'm, I'm really old. <laughs> um, I think it was if you get too much tibial femoral ER in late ER. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You get a bunion. Like that's literally what a bunion is. Yeah. You get it? Did mm -hmm. Peter write that one down? Peter, that was gold. I just gave you. I just gave you. Like I fed you. Good morning. Happy Thursday. I have neuro coffee in hand, and it is. Perfect. All right. So <clears throat> I know wides are um, because if you look at angles, they're more compressive by nature. So they're higher pressure. Um, but we always talk about how like the narrow pylon is the worst case scenario, just in terms of like end game dealing with the pressure strategies. Is the reason like the narrow is a harder system to deal with pressure wise because there's just like a taller stack of fluid working on the pelvic floor. And so there, there'll be more pressure down to deal with in that situation. Um, okay, a couple of things. So a narrow by design is a lower pressure system. Right, so um, you could go um, surface area of the diaphragm, smaller, okay, lower pressure. Potentially, 
potentially um, a greater distance top to bottom, um, which would distribute pressure over a larger surface area through the axial skeleton. So that's lower pressure. Eccentric orientation of an anterior outlet by bias, lower pressure. And then, so put your arms like this, straight up and down, straight up and down, okay? And then go like that, okay. Did you close the space at the top? Yes. Okay. And what does that do to the downward pressure that would be associated with the, the pressure on the outlet? Increases. Increase. There you go. So you're in a little bit of a pickle, right? You don't have like any one great trait within that, that archetype and configuration that lends itself to high pressure going upward, like to be able to push into the ground so I can move upward. They are, they are getting driven into the ground. Um, their downward velocity is biased. Their, their, their velocity is downward biased. Um, so again, it's just, it tends to be um, the, the greatest challenge in regards to overcoming gravity. So with narrows being expansive by nature, um, is that essentially for, at the pelvic floor, all the, all the fluid in the pelvis is constantly, just has more of a tendency to open up down into it, essentially, because of that eccentric orientation. Well, again, from an expanded representation, absolutely. Right, it, it just stands to reason. Yeah. You're, gonna move, you're always going to move in the direct of, direction of expansion, um, barring any unforeseen circumstances with the new space telescope screwing up the world. Um, so, yes, you will move in that direction. Because okay, because one and one of the things I I think I have a little bit of confusion with is like we'll call it the size of the diaphragm because. So for a narrow, smaller mm -hmm. diaphragm, so yep. per um, given unit pressure, there yep. should be less quick of an increase in a rate of force with a smaller surface area, right? So, so, so I'm sorry, so, yeah. per, okay. per given like unit for uh, unit pressure, like pushing on the diaphragm, there will be less quick of an increase in the rate of force. Right, less magnitude because there's just less surface area. Right, something. less surface area. So, so it would it would be a, a again, it's a it's a lower pressure system. So, comparing that to a wide with a with a, just a greater surface area, the diaphragm that seems to me like just the the force overall in the system might be a greater magnitude to deal with for the pelvic floor just due to the, the pressurization. I mean, I understand that it's, it's pushing back up. Is that strictly why it has less of an issue dealing with that greater magnitude? As opposed well, to the narrow, which the east edge of orientation allows it to follow. I mean, gen generally speaking, yes, because again, if, if I don't expand so if 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 I produce a downward force, but I also apply an upward resistance, I do have an advantage, right? Now, it's not that gravity's not pushing down on everybody, right? Everybody loses that battle to gravity, right? It's just who's pushing up against it more. And then, it, and again, if you look at, if you look at the, the, the configurations and say you've got a, a broad circumference in the thorax, broad circumference in the pelvis, that's why that system is very good at producing high pressures, okay? But also <clears throat> not great with anything that's velocity-based. Right. Because it doesn't have a differential, okay? So very, very high pressures, but very slow, generally speaking, if we were comparing apples to apples.
Good morning, happy Friday. I have NeuroCoffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, a very busy Friday coming up. Uh, quick housekeeping item. Uh, the applications for the Intensive 20 are now open. The email went out last night, so please check your email for that. Um, applications tend to fill up very quickly. We have a, we have a cap that, that we keep the, um, the total number of applications under uh, to make it manageable. Please be thoughtful with your answers, but um, let's be expeditious in regards to getting those applications back as quickly as possible. Digging into today's Q&A, this is with Zach. Um, this is a brief video, but it, but it it hits on a very hard on a on a uh, concept that I'm very very fond of. There are elements of trainability that tend to get ignored in protocolish representations, bringing somebody back from an injury or a post-surgical, where people say, "Well, you can't do this type of activity yet. You can't do this type of activity yet," and so on and so forth, because you have to be protective in these these early phases of rehab. When the reality is that if you have a representative model and you understand what elements are contributing to certain elements of performance, you understand that everything is trainable. You just have to kind of see it for what elements of the system are behaving in a certain manner. So in this case, Zach was talking about, I believe, a, a, a client that was coming off of a knee injury or knee surgery, and you can't do plyometrics because you can't bounce across the ground. However, you can if you look at the system as to how it behaves during that type of an activity, there are parts of the system that you can start to train immediately. And so you'll see elements of this in like Charlie Francis's vertical integration, or if you're a conjugate sequence guy, you can see this, or a block periodization guy, you'll see where you're starting to layer these, these qualities um, over other elements throughout the entire training program. So there are certain elements that, are, that are, uh, will deteriorate over time if they're not trained frequently enough, and um, the, the elements of, uh, the, of dynamics, like um, if we're talking about like power output and things like that, where we're talking about ground-based activities where you would typically see the plyometrics fall into that category, they're trainable right from the get-go if you look at it from the right perspective. So that's what this video is about, perspective as to what's actually going on with the system. So thank you, Zach. Great question. And again, we, I, I so rudely interrupted him. Um, because I wanted to talk about this on the coffee call. So again, thank you for your patience. Everybody have an outstanding Friday. Um, I'll try to get the podcast up uh, from last week and this week, this weekend. So um, we'll give that a shot. Everybody have a great weekend. I'll see you next week. Man, devil. All right. It's an expression. I <laughs> know. Uh, I know. I'm not. My goodness. People are so sensitive. <laughs> um, get over yourselves. <laughs> um. I have a force plate question, um, just okay. kind of like interpretation of data. So I have a female basketball player that I'm working with um, out from an ACL. Um, so she's like seven months out at this point. I got her a few weeks ago when she came back to school. So I'm not really doing like any plyometric stuff with her yet. Um, she's doing just a lot of other stuff. Why not? Uh, she is not ready for it. Why not? Um, just like a lot of... Um, isolated strength deficits or force production deficits um and just like range of motion issues and like just movement everything say hey hey alex um i don't think zach understands my question you say everything can be a plyometric depending on how well <laughs> yeah <laughs> 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 I had to get somebody that, that was at the intensive. You know, um, Grace, you sat through the intensive, didn't you? Yeah. Why isn't she doing any plyometrics, dude? I guess this is going to come down to how we're defining a plyometric. Yeah, it is. All right. I don't really have her leaving the ground. I didn't say she had to leave the ground, did I? In fact, she could do it sitting down if you wanted to. Come on now. You ever do a seated medicine ball slam? I guess I wouldn't traditionally define that as a plyometric, but why not? I just always thought about it as leaving the ground. Uh huh. Like, so you ever do one high box, high box squat? So so he, hips above knees, slam the ball into the ground. Do you know what happens? Your butt leaves the bench, leaves the your butt goes up off the box. Okay, you get it. 
Yeah. Do, you see, do you see that the axial skeleton is trainable separate from the extremities? Yes. You see that you're preparing the axial skeleton for all the stuff when you start to add the extremities back in? Makes sense. Yeah. Do you see that you're saving time by starting now with that? You ever wonder why some people respond so quickly? Certain archetypes tend to respond very, very quickly after an ACL when you start to do the, the ground-based stuff through the feet and the bouncy, bouncy stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you start working on axial skeletal behavior while you're protecting the ACL. Everything will come back faster. So now, now that I've rudely interrupted your question. No, that was, that's, I'll, I need to think about that. I'm going to definitely have some follow-ups on that, but yeah. that's not a rude interruption. That's a good sidebar. Okay. Was that okay? We call it a sidebar when, when you, when I, when I interrupt your question. It's, right. it's your call. It's your call. So you can take it. Right. Dude, I'm just, I'm just here to kill time. Trust me. <laughs>